and 1130. All the uh, September 7, 2022 uh, DM uh, MPO executive committee meeting order. And, uh, so moved. Second. Second by Gatto. Discussion. All favor say aye. 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 Both same sign. Mentions. Motion carries. Uh, I have to raise to vote on the minutes from the August 10 meeting. I uh, move. Motion by County. Second. Second by Gatto. Discussion. <laughs> All in favor say aye. 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 Same sign. Any abstentions? Motion carries. Mm -hmm. And four is the consent to vote on contracts and expenses, Todd. Yeah, we just have one expense. Um, it's for the uh, bike counters that we have installed. There's an upgrade that we need to put in um, so we can do over the air um, retrieval of the, the data. Um, some of the counters had 3G transmitters in them. We needed to upgrade to 4G. Uh, the, the expense is about just a little over $3,000. We have the budget in our equipment budget for it. I would recommend approval. Be happy to answer any questions. Questions? Move to Move. approve. Second. Second. Who, who moved it? Was that Tom? Yeah. Motion by Congressman, second by God. All in favor, say aye. 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 Close same sign. Any abstentions? Motion carries. Uh, item five is report and vote on the Water Trails Bill Grant Sub Agreement Amendments. Todd? Yeah, thank you. Um, as you're all aware, uh, we had the build grant agreement that we revised and was uh, amended earlier this year. Um, we changed uh, the scope of the project, broke it into a couple different pieces. The first phase being uh, the Scott and uh, Harriet Street uh, parts of the project as what's going to be completed with the build grant money. And then Prospect and um, Birdland would be done at a later time. Uh, starting by 2027, September of 2027. With that, those changes to the build grant agreement, we needed to revise the, the sub-agreements. Next slide. Um, so yeah, I kind of stated that next Todd, slide. Todd, kind of question for you, Mr. Yeah. Chair. Just clarification, and I think everyone needs to know, just because we're using all the build grant for Harriet and Scott, Part of the build grant, we still have to complete the portion of prospect in Berlin. So you can't right. just kind of skim over that, like, okay, yeah, we're 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 gonna use all this money, but we still have to complete that other portion, Todd. So I think that's right. very clear that you need to make sure that everyone in the MPO realizes that. No, that, that's correct. We have to start those projects by September of 2027, and they would be completed. Um, within a couple of years. And ICON is raising the money for those projects. That's where the money would come from to, to do those. The MPO wouldn't be um, participating in the funding of those projects, but we will help manage those projects. But the MPO is still responsible until the bill grant is, is completed under what the stipulations of the bill grant. And that is prospect in Birdland. So we need to make sure that that we all are aware of that. And I've made that clear with ICON too. Everyone needs to be aware that we still have to make that commitment. Yep. Those two things have to be completed. So the MPO organization isn't responsible to repay the build grant. Correct. Okay. Next so a uh, quick question, based on what, based on Joe's comments, Todd, so is the agreement, um, is, it, is it going to mandate that the MPO uh, the, and the governments would be responsible to come up with that funding for yeah. Prospect in Birdland? No, ICON is um, raising the money and, and responsible for funding the build of those two projects. But, but ultimately the MPO is responsible <laughs> to fulfill what the stipulation is in the grant, whether the money's raised privately, whether it's not, we still have to complete it by, what is it, 2027, Todd? We have to start them by September of 2027. Okay, so we have to start at Berglund and Prospect by 2027. 
Correct. Okay. And, and part of the, the funding sub agreement that we have, and, and Scott can talk more in depth about this, but if for whatever reason, um, ICON wouldn't uh, fund those, they have liability insurance that would reimburse whatever build grant funds needed to be repaid. It wouldn't come out of the MPO. They have insurance for $25 million repayment? They have liability insurance that makes the MPO an additional insured. And so if there was some repayment that had to be made, then they, that would be coming from, I doubt it would be the whole 25 million if we complete, you know, Scott and and, and uh, Harriet, um, that's the bulk of the money. Um, there's probably five, six million um, that would ne maybe need to be on those other two projects. Okay, I just, I, I, I'm, I'm in fact, you know, I'm, I'm completely, I, I just want to make sure everybody's going in with their eyes open, Todd, and you can't just, yep. burn, you know, you, you, you've got to make sure that everyone's aware of all the details that we have for this. You can't just keep, yeah, we're going to get this done. It, it, that, I mean, we are going to get it done, but we need to make sure that we're all in and well, yeah. we're going to get it taken care of. Yeah, Berlin and, and Prospect have to be completed as well, and they have to start by September of 2027. That is uh, correct. Next slide. Okay, on, on subagreement two, um, the major things that we updated on that were um, what elements were to be covered uh, under the build grant, like I mentioned, uh, you know, the amended build grant talks about this first phase being Scott and Harriet. We updated the, the project costs, uh, added language um, that the amended build grant, uh, Joe, to your, your point about the work must be commenced on prospect in Birdland locations and updated um, other wording to be consistent with the build grant agreement. Fairly minor changes um, just to making sure everything was consistent. Uh, next slide. Uh, Subagreement three, this is uh, some of the funding agreements between uh, ICON, uh, MPO, Polk County, uh, County Conservation and, and, and the city, um, laid out the city's contribution and when those monies would come into the project, uh, clarified language about uh, payment responsibility for the tree mitigation that was done uh, earlier this year when we were hoping to, to bid the project this spring, um, clarifying the language um, regarding documentation to be provided uh, to the city in the timeline for the, providing those documents related to, to reimbursements and payment. And then updated the, again, the, the language to be consistent with the build grant agreement. Uh, next slide. And then uh, subagreement four, uh, Again, minor uh, changes just to make sure everything was consistent uh, with the, the build grant, the amended build grant agreement, uh, just including those phasing the estimates and then just general language to make sure everything was consistent. Be happy to answer any questions on this. Uh, we would recommend approval. Uh, we'd like to get these approved um, today and at policy next week so we can get everything back to the DOT um, so we can get the, uh, the bid out uh, on the street, uh, so we can have the letting in November. So just we're clear on this, but Joe's point, uh, Todd and mm -hmm. myself, we understood when we said from this from the beginning on this, there is always an inherent amount of risk on this project. Sure. Uh, but we mitigated the risk to the full extent we possibly can through, through the agreements that we have. I guess right. Comfortable that we've mitigated that risk to the extent we can. Yeah, I think we've done as much as we possibly could to mitigate and, and lessen the, the risk to the MPO as much as possible. And in subagreement two, um, paragraph eight on page six, it, it's referenced that Central Iowa Water Trails will defend, indemnify, and hold harmless MPO in the event of. Central Iowa Water Trails is a breach of any of its representations, warranties, or obligations set forth in the agreement. And the agreement is to complete Prospect and Birdland along with the initial phase of the project. 
just want to make sure everybody's got their eyes open. I, I just, we were kind of, we've kind of breezed over that a few times and haven't made that very clear. And I think that not only the exec, but the policy committee should have their eyes wide open to know that we need to complete the project as it's laid out through the build grant. Yep. That was, just want to make sure that we're going to clarify to everyone, not just the people that have been involved I know Ted and I have been on the committee. And the mayor's been on there, and so we we're aware of it. But there might be there might be others that aren't aware of it from other jurisdictions that don't understand what's going on with it. And we need to be very transparent about it. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. Uh, anything further for any questions for Tom before we I'll ask for a motion? Your motion. Move approval. Second, okay, Randleman. Mayor Randleman, any further discussion? All in favor then, please say aye. 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 Well, same sign. Any abstentions? Mr. Chairman, Ankeny will abstain. All right, thank you, Mark. Mm -hmm. That motion carries. All right, item six is a report and vote on the fiscal year uh, 2024 Iowa Clean Air Attainment Program application. Zach? Yes, thank you. Um, last month, we had presented to you the uh, applications that were submitted to us for Clean Air Attainment Program funds. Um, those five applications that we received are included on your screen there. Um, we went over those um, at last month's meeting. Um, this month, they're on the agenda for approval. Um, once they're approved by policy, we'll go ahead and submit the resolutions onto the project sponsors so that they're able to include those in their um, applications and submit them onto the DOT prior to the October 1st um, application deadline. Um, if you have any questions about the ICAP applications or the process, I'd be happy to take those. Um, but otherwise, um, they're on here for your approval. Zach, any questions for Zach? Your motion. Motion, Reva. Second, Randleman. Motion a second. All in favor say aye, please. Aye. 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 Well, same sign. Any abstentions? Motion carries. All right. Item seven is a report on the model ordinance uh, regarding bikes and personal transportation devices. Aspen. Thank you. So as you all got your agenda packet, the bike and pedestrian round table has been working on a long-term goal of ours this year. Um, since November or December, when I got on board, they wanted to, again, revisit um, a best practice for regulating bikes and personal transportation devices on the roadway. So again, this is something that's coming out of the bike pet round table. Um, and so in your agenda packet, you have a final draft report and some supplemental materials that we put together. Um, and Mindy Moore, who I believe is on the call, um, who's a transportation planner uh, with HCR, and Jeff Wiggins, who's not on the call today um, from the city of Des Moines, um, were both incredibly instrumental in helping us lead this initiative. Um, so I just wanted to give them a shout out as well. Again, this is just a model ordinance. It's very generic, and the things that we included in it um, are just things that have come through uh, the bike head realm um, in terms of transportation that we think that our localities should revisit um, and, and consider adopting locally. Um, again, everything that's included in there is consistent with the Code of Iowa, but there's also additional regulations offered to address these historical points of conflict that we have between vehicles and non-vehicular traffic. Um, and this is just an opportunity for us to clarify some of the gray areas um, that, are, that are existing in state code as well as current driving behaviors. Um, and also this furthers all four goals um, that we have in our long range transportation plan mobilized into our so why a model ordinance? Again, this is a document that can regulate, educate, and coordinate drivers and, and non-vehicular uh, modes of transportation a little bit better. And this is also a really great solution to transportation improvements that doesn't require construction time or additional funding. Um, and then also why now long-term bike head round table goal. We also have our upcoming um, active transportation plan, which will be finished um, this upcoming spring coming up. 
Um, and so this is a good initiative to target that. <coughs> and also with the NPO's um, agreement to go ahead for our safe streets and roads for all application, this is another initiative that we can work with that. Of, this is what we're doing in our region to improve transportation safety. And then also, why are we including bicycles and personal transportation devices in the 20 ordinance? Well, because we have a multimodal system here in the metro. And also, a couple jurisdictions um, have reached out to us specifically that they are ready to address these new and, and becoming more popular modes of, of uh, travel types. So this would be um, a personally owned scooter or, or something like that. So it's not micro mobility. We Google that and you see the bike share scooter share programs. That's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about personally owned uh, devices. Next slide. Um, so a little bit about the timeline again. Back in November, we decided this is something we wanted to pursue as the round table um, for this upcoming year. Um, and then throughout the spring, we, we had a few special meetings um, with interested groups, um, basically a subset of the bike side round table that includes some other regional stakeholders. Um, and then around May, we had finalized um, our initial draft which then in June and July was reviewed by various localities um, as well as legal counsel here um, in July. And then in August, the bike head um, officially voted to recommend the draft that you have in the defendant packet um, for consideration um, in October for the technical executive policy board. And then also last week, we presented uh, this ordinance to the technical committee, just as a discussion. Next slide. Um, so again, the ordinance chapter is again very straightforward. We talk about definitions, uh, the types of traffic code that applies, different motor vehicle operations, responsible writing, things of that nature. And again, pedicabs and bike and scooter share programs are not addressed in this ordinance. But since it is a model, if your locality decides that you want to address other device types not addressed in this ordinance, it is completely customizable, and you can go ahead and do that um, with your city staff and your council member. Next slide. I will say a few words about the Code of Iowa, but I, I'm not going to read this to you. Again, you can all read this um, at, uh, at a later time. But what I will say is one of the biggest uh, points of contention that have uh, come out of our reviews is that, well, what about differences between local regulations and state law? Well, the state of Iowa, um, we do have a law that says local authorities can adopt additional regulations um, for the operation of bicycles. Um, and similar devices, as long as they're not in direct conflict with current IO code. So one of the primary examples of that, which I'll go into more detail um, on the next slide, is, um, well, if we require drivers to change lanes to pass, or require that they leave at least three foot lateral passing distance, what it does that in state code? Well, state code says that you need to pass at a safe distance. We, with this model ordinance, are just specifying what we define as that safe distance. So that's either changing lanes or leaving three feet, depending on which um, bicycle facility um, this non this non vehicular driver is operating in. Um, and then also, I will point out that the Iowa DOT currently instructs drivers to change lanes to pass when um, passing a bicycle completely. Um, and so this is another example of just even if it's not state law, this is a best practice here, and so it's not. State law has defined exactly what that is, but you as a locality are taking it upon yourself to define what that what that safe passing distance is. Next slide. Um, and next slide. I am just going to focus on three of these, which I highlight on the next slide, uh, but I assume will be most for discussion here. But again, you can ask questions about any of them. But the primary components um, that much of our current bicycle ordinances in the metro don't address are these uh, 10, 11 things. And so I'm gonna focus on the change length to pass, which is on page nine of the ordinance, um, the three feet lateral passing distance and the dead red light allowance, all located on page nine of the ordinance. So the change length to pass again is saying that when you as a driver are operating in the same travel lane as a cyclist or someone riding a personal transportation device, so let's say these two, these two um, that you are required to change lanes completely, and then when safe to do so, you can then get back on that right side of the road. This does not apply when a bicyclist is operating in a bicycle uh, lane or on a shared use path, um, uh, but this is when you're in that same travel lane. And again, the reason why we're specifying this is for safety and clarity. Safety for that cyclist who's probably traveling a lot slower than you are in your vehicle, 
and then also clarity so you know when I'm operating in the same lane, what is a safe passing distance? Here we define that. For the three feet lateral passing distance, this is you need to give at least three feet distance between the at the end of your vehicle, which includes your mirror, um, between you and the cyclist um, when they are passing either on when they are operating on something like a paved shoulder or a bicycle lane, some sort of dedicated facility. And again, same with the change right to pass keeps people safer, it keeps you safe, it keeps the other person safe, and then also clarifying what is a safe passing distance in this situation. And then lastly, I'll touch on the dead red light allowance. And what this is, is if you are um, a bicyclist who's traveling in um, a travel lane and you come up to an intersection, a signal intersection um, that has loop detectors on the ground and your bicycle or your scooter whatever it is you're writing, um, is not, does not trip off the signal. That is kind of an inoperable signal. And so you either have to wait for a vehicle to show up to you know, put enough magnetic interference there to then change the light, or you have to dismount from your bicycle and then go over, hopefully if there's a pedestrian actuated uh, signal and push that in order to change the light. And so we put that in here, again, for safety and clarity, but also for efficiency. So if you as a cyclist are traveling and then you have to wait around for a car to come up, um, that's pretty inefficient for you. And then also um, clarifying, well, in Iowa code, they just, it's kind of a little bit of a gray area of whether or not a bicycle all the time is constituted as a vehicle or if it's different. So it's the same in terms of you need to apply, abide by the same rules and regulations that motor vehicles do. But then also we are just kind of encouraging um, our communities to think about that a little bit differently. Uh, in terms of, well, if you're at an inoperable light as a vehicle, you treat that as a four-way stop. And so if you riding a non-vehicle are unable to trip the signal, that's an inoperable signal for you, which is why we are um, recommending uh, for a dead red light allowance that you as a cyclist, if the signal is not picking you up, if there are no other vehicles present and you abide by all other traffic um, rules and, you're not, and you are taking that danger upon yourself, you may proceed through that intersection. Um, and then I will stop here because this is a lot of information and open it up for questions that either Mindy or I can answer. I know she's online. Um, but also if anyone has any questions about the other components that they'd like to touch on, we're happy to answer questions before I talk about next steps. Yes, well, I was coming a little bit. I, I, again, I appreciate this as a bicycle, but I really do appreciate it. But I did meet with uh, with my parks and rec director and my police chief on this. And they 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 had actually reached out to me and had some concerns that that maybe this is in conflict with state law. Not not that they're not they're opposed to this by any means either. I mean, they they want to have uh, have something that would be consistent through the metro and, and would provide for better safety. But my police chief was especially concerned that that there may be some challenges to. Uh, enforcement of some of this if it, if it did conflict. So, it, and I don't, I haven't gone through, uh, you know, with a fine tooth comb. I'm just, yeah, I, I'm all in favor of doing a model ordinance. Uh, my concern though is, and I just want to make sure we are on solid ground that this is not inconsistent with Iowa law uh, and that, you know, that we, this is enforceable for any jurisdiction that would want to. I talked to Todd a little bit about this this morning. And Todd, I don't know if I don't know where we have I know this is not a voting item for today, but uh, yeah. I just want to make sure that if we're going to do this, that we're on solid ground on what what the contents are that we're not going to be any jurisdiction that does want to pass this is not going to be challenged. Yeah, and I, I did ask uh, Scott to to do a review uh, based on some of your concerns, Bob, and and so he's going to take a look at it, um, and we'll, we'll bring back that discussion uh, next month as well. Um, Aspen? Aspen? Yeah, sorry, Miss Ruth. Hey, I would be remiss if I didn't thank you and the crew that worked on this. To Bob's point, um, I kind of wheel back, I hate to say how many years, when we did the first Connect plan and tried to do a model ordinance, and things have gotten so much more complicated and intense because the dreams coming true you know, the popularity and the use. So I really appreciate everybody keeping up on this and working on this. I think it's gonna be a constant um, 
a, a constant issue of match and state and local requirements that's been there ever since day one. But thanks to everybody. Mindy, I'm glad you're on the phone. You, you wheel back historically on this kind of effort too. So glad to see you involved. So I just wanna say thanks to everybody. Uh, yeah, this gets, uh, I'm, I'm glad it's a lot of work for you because <laughs> it shows that the dream is happening and, and um, um, what we were thinking, everybody, I worked with a lot of better minds than mine, but what everybody was dreaming about is coming to fruition and this is just a part of it. Can I, can I, this Tom, can I get just a quick question in, um, staff yeah. about, uh, cause I've been, we've talked about this at, uh, Pocahontas Conservation Board level and, um, at other levels, as far as the e-bike definition piece, uh, cause I think that that's just going to be, can become more and more of a huge issue all the time and the, the different levels of e-bikes. And so are we saying we're going to have a definition of, of what's going to be approved, what, what, what's going to be, uh, be able to be used on the trails and what's not um how do you see that playing out so many i'm sure you could talk a little bit more about this but e-bikes are defined in state law currently and they have different classifications of those so depending on how heavy they are how many wheels um and then also how fast they go mindy if you want to touch on that i think that's been um yeah so a little over a year ago, the state adopted uh, definitions for low speed electric bicycles and they have the three classes of bicycles in there. So our, our uh, model ordinance uses that same definition. So that's consistent with state code. Um, the definition that is not in state code um, would be one for an electric scooter or one for um, the personal transportation device itself, which we, sort of discussed amongst ourselves of what made the most sense for that. And we use that as a mobility device under 150 pounds, um, which may or may not have an electric motor for assistance or sole propulsion um, and speeds less than 20 miles per hour. The, the way our model ordinance is written, those types of devices, well, I should back up one second. The, the way the state um, when they added the e-bicycles, they also said that they were allowed anywhere the bicycles were allowed. Um, so we did the same thing basically with a principal or a personal transportation device. So those would also be allowed um, essentially everywhere that a bicycle or an e-bicycle is allowed. Um, we did comment that there may be some places where cities would want to customize where they're allowed, such as on dirt trails, for example. Um, on downtown sidewalks, for example, where different jurisdictions have different conditions that they, you know, they're trying to look out for and they might want to customize those particular areas. Okay, great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Any further comments? All right. We're good. Uh, yeah, I, I want to please take my comments. I, I want to make sure that we are constructive and I really do appreciate all the work that I know I've been in the past and looking at this thing it's a lot of work so thanks for everything that's been done so far but uh you know, I just want to make sure that we're good so if we can have one more review on that before we take it to the board I would appreciate it. I do have one more slide just to quickly talk about next oh, steps yeah. here. Yeah. And again so we'll discuss it at policy then next week and then we'll also I'll also be presenting it to the Metro Advisory Council next week uh, to get their feedback since I know that they've worked on a lot of model ordinances in the past. Um, and then, then throughout the next uh, month or so, we'll incorporate additional feedback. And feel free to reach out to myself, Mindy, or Jeff with additional questions if we don't have time to discuss them today or after the meeting. Um, we are always happy to do so. And then uh, we'll bring the model ordinance back uh, for a vote if, if we want to in October. Otherwise, we can push that to November if there's just more discussion that needs to be had. And then afterwards, and again, this is just a thumbs up. These are things our metro should be looking into. Uh, it's not you know, an official adoption of this. It's just we as the MPO giving our recommendation of, yes, these are things we should address. And then after that, then if that goes, yes, we'll share the model ordinance with the local jurisdictions for consideration. And then also a big component of this is that educational campaign that we'll need to, you know, go hand in hand with this. Um, because this is new for a lot of people. Um, and a lot of times, so what we're doing here is just if we know what proponents we are going to have consistent around the, the region, then we want to go ahead and then do an educational campaign around that too. So people are aware that changes have been made. 
we, will you give us a feedback from Mac before we take Certainly, yeah. Right? So, so I will be with them 7 30 Tuesday morning. So I can send that and Tuesday she's our email. Yep. I will get that to so you. Well, so yep. Kind of if anyone wants to adopt it or if it, yeah. just a few or sure. Guides my state law. I think that's great. That's a great point. Yeah. Okay. All right. Great. Thanks, Rasmus. All right. Uh, item eight is the report on the 2019 greenhouse gas emissions at the Missouri update now. Thank you. There we go. I'm going to get over here. Um, so, in January of 2022, this year, uh, we joined ICLE, and one of the pieces of joining ICLE is that we were able to access our clear path system and start pumping out uh, greenhouse gas emissions reports. For beverage communities of PMCO. Um, so, I just wanted to give you a update on that. So, the bulk of the emissions data has come in. So, we have uh, the biggest one was Mid American. We received that back within the last couple of weeks, sifting through that and putting that in. Um, and so, we have a handful of things prepared today, and there are a handful of things that will still continue to come out. So, right now on the table um, at our, on our website, uh, slash metro GHG. You'll find a snapshot of each of the metro communities, um, greenhouse gas emissions, uh, pie charts and graphs and things like that. And then we'll also, um, later today, I'll be updating the transportation ones, and we'll get into a little bit of those next. As these continue to come in, so we still have Waterworks, um, Metro Waste Authority, and a handful of other smaller pieces um, that are part of this pie. Those will be coming in, I would assume, over about the next month. Um, Waterworks is going to be the biggest holdup, just Wanting to get that methodology um, down as we consider regionalization, what does that mean for the next edition of any of these? Um, and so, once those are completed, the full reports will come out. I'll present that the regional analysis to the NPO and then provide each of the cities with their own um, community wide. So, what you'll see on our website um, for those in the room, so you'll see here there's a pie chart on the left, um, literally showing just kind of the proportions of each of the uh, sectors that we do have imported for now. Um, for some of your cities, you might have a gray area for industrial. Um, the energy provider is allowed to omit things. And so if there's gray, it's likely either A, um, there's an omission, or B, you might not have um, industrial, say, wind or ice or something like that. Uh, there's also a breakdown of the table so that you can see uh, what the actual megatons, metric tons that are going out, and the proportions of each, uh, and then another table as well. So each of the cities have one of these. I'll continue to kind of update this and add a little bit more analysis. Um, if you have any questions straight away, any community is welcome to reach out to me and kind of walk through this um, and show implications for the next phase. So, uh, but getting to MPO specific things, um, one of the next agenda items is a federal register request for a potential performance measure on, on tracking our greenhouse gas emissions from transportation. And so, one of the things I did with this data. They start pulling that out so we can start seeing these trends on our own. Um, and then uh, with these next items, we can kind of consider how this plays into those factors. So you can see here 2011 to 2021. 2015, I'm not sure what the flip is. We did check the numbers. Um, it dips down on the 2020 number, but uh, it just might have been a straight off year. Uh, but as you can see, this is from gasoline. So these are our um, light trucks, uh, motorcycles, personal vehicles, and things like that. We really do have kind of an upward swing um, on this graph and it will continue. Uh, the 2021 data I do have, but the emissions factors, which is how you kind of calculate um, what metric tons of the emissions come out has not been produced yet. Once that is, I'll pump that in and get that out and I have a bar graph as well. Next slide. So we also break it down by diesel. Diesel and gasoline have different emissions factors, different emission um, contents and things like that. You can see the upward slide here. Um, it's quite consistent from 2011 to 2020. Um, and then in 2021, uh, just based on what I pulled, it's again, just a notch up. I think obviously with the pandemic, things like that, you can see um, that that's gonna continue. Also our Metro has uh, more of the shipping facilities and things like that. So we're moving into that area. And then if we total this together on the next slide, we can see the total emissions. So this is both the breakdown of gasoline emissions plus the diesel emissions um, and how that is going. So we have a little bit of a bumpy ride in the early 2010s um, and consistently upwards and then of course the 2020 um, drop off. 
when we do have a couple more years behind 2020, um, that outlier will be um, less of an issue. Um, but we are keeping an eye on that and how it does fluctuate any of our trend lines and things like that. Uh, and so we wanted to bring this to you. Um, the final reports will be coming out, I would say, in October, November, December, based on uh, when I get the data back. But uh, since this has been a long time coming, I wanted to let you know. Uh, there's more information on our website, but obviously I'm happy to take any questions at this time or after the meeting as well. That's it for me. Awesome. Any questions for us? All right, thank you. Uh, then item nine would be a report on the proposed greenhouse gas emissions performance measure. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, next one, six. Yeah, thanks, Allison. That's uh, about two months ago in July, the US DOT Federal Highway Administration released a notice of proposed rulemaking. So when that is a, 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 a notice asking for comments regarding a new uh, national performance measure that will look at greenhouse gas emissions for both state DOTs and NPOs. And so uh, what this proposed greenhouse gas measure will look at, uh, it'll, uh, it looks to seek declining CO2 emissions on the national uh, highway system on all 50 states and the national highway system. And uh, these will be declining uh, greenhouse gas emissions from a base year of 2021. Um, uh, the reason why this uh, rulemaking came into being was that uh, the US DOT hopes to align transportation emissions with the uh, national uh, greenhouse gas goals and reducing uh, those by 50% by 2030 and by net zero by 2050. As for other national performance measures, NPOs can either uh, support the state DOTs in their uh, performance goals or uh, establish their own regional uh, targets and goals for their region. Um, as for the other national performance measures, again, there are no penalties for NPOs if we do not meet the targets or if we do not make any significant progress on these measures. Uh, very briefly, the uh, performance measure looks at a percentage reduction between a reporting year and the baseline year of 2021. Um, very briefly, how, how the CO2 emissions are calculated is that you'll take the fuel consumed to benefit features such as uh, Iowa. Multiply that by uh, emission factor to kind of convert uh, gasoline into emissions, and then uh, multiply that by the proportion of vehicle miles traveled on the national highway system compared to all of the roadways within the uh, geography. So currently, the Iowa DOT is working with Nashville to review uh, these uh, proposed measures, and they also encourage NPOs to review and uh, consider submitting comments as well. Uh, the public comment statement ends in October. But uh, I'll be happy to take any questions or comments you might uh, have before then. Questions or comments you see? Uh, I have a time to be a report on the Purple Highway, Purple Hard Highway. So Good afternoon, everyone. Um, can we get you up to speed on progress being made on the ongoing effort to designate the Pearl Park Highway as interstate? Um, you, you see this before, you're going to start seeing it more often. It is kind of a working document, so it's going to evolve a little bit as the process becomes more refined. Um, as you know, the Iowa DOT has been undertaking a stakeholder process. It's largely done. Uh, we continue to wait for uh, the, the finalized report to be given to us, and one of the critical pieces that we're hoping to get from them are the meeting notes so that we understand who's in the room, what was said to them, and we really have full understanding because we'll need to continue those conversations so it's helpful to know what came before. Um, as stated for phases two and three will be uh, happening currently is our approach to it. Um, phase two being the political piece, phase three being the technical piece. We'll talk about both of those a little bit more today. Um, I've updated the language on phase four here a little bit, uh, just to make sure the IODOT is comfortable here. We previously did it in summer of 2023, we moved that to fall 2023, but this is a target. Our initial intent was that we could start the process. Uh, we're going to be working closely with the DOT on this, obviously. Um, they just want to make sure that they wouldn't even initiate the process until they had the exemptions, uh, which is fine by us. So one of the pieces of this is more on the political side is uh, developing an implementation plan. And we have begun meeting with the Greater Hawaiian Partnership to discuss uh, strategy and an overall implementation plan. 
Uh, in addition, I'll let you know that we have scheduled a meeting with Iowa DOT leadership uh, for later this month. Uh, our chair and vice chair will both be there along with partnership staff and IPO staff. And lastly, I'll note that we do intend to schedule additional meetings with stakeholders as we put together that plan, uh, including core meetings today, stakeholders as well as economic development practitioners. Last thing I'll note is that uh, as we indicated last month, we did request and receive an updated scope of services from HNTV. Uh, you might recall that we had asked for a scope of services to do that additional analysis. Uh, we had had that scope of services brought forward to you in 2021. That was postponed when the DOT wanted to do the stakeholder process that we are now lining up. So uh, we got that back um, and there are no major changes in there. Uh, we did ask the Iowa DOT and Federal Highway to review this. They both had a chance to do so and said that this continues to meet our requirements. Um, the fee is for $206,000. Staff has outlined a few different options for payment, uh, similar to uh, the Safe Streets grant opportunity. We see three basic ways to approach this. One is to pull from MPA reserves. Another one would be to share costs between communities on the corridor. Um, and then we did a formula had been developed previously that is based on population crime. We could pull that back out and, and update that if we needed to. Um, and then the third being uh, some combination of MPO reserves and local dollars. Staff here feel comfortable recommending how the region use the MPO reserves on this. Uh, but again, this is your decision. Uh, we're open to your guidance on this. Uh, and barring any, if you're ready for it, we can bring this back to you in October. A uh, copy of that scope of services and the structure were included along with the agenda packet. That's it for me, unless I can answer any questions. All right. Yeah. Any questions for Gunnar on this one? Before we bring ahead, thanks. All right, uh, item 11 then is a legislative update, Bill. Thank you. There's not a lot that's gone on in the last month as far as legislative. Um, just where we left off last time, uh, an appropriations bill has been passed by the House. Uh, it's been introduced to the Senate uh, in their appropriations committee, but hasn't proceeded anywhere yet. So we'll keep an eye on that. Um, Everyone's on recess at the moment, so things will not nothing's going to happen anytime soon. But here in the next month or so, we think there'll be some movement on that. Um, just to follow up on a few other things on the next slide. We had the uh, the Inflation Reduction Act was passed last month. There's some transportation related elements of that, such as the Neighborhood Access and Equity Grant Program. This is a new program. We're still waiting any sort of details from the DOT about application process and and, and a lot of those. But that's something that will be. Uh, communities around here will be eligible for, so we'll keep you keep that in mind as uh, as we learn more. Make sure to share that with our members. And then just one other thing, somewhat related on the bipartisan infrastructure bill, USDOT has released a grant uh, website to help keep track of everything. It's a matrix. If you go to the next slide, uh, you can see what just an example of what this looks like. Um, up there on the screen on the previous slide was a link to that, but we also have this link from our website too. So. Um, you know, again, we'll keep track of what's going on here and make sure to alert our communities when things are coming up. But if at any time you want to see what these programs are and read about them, know what the due dates are, who's eligible, all of this is on this website now that's linked from our website. So we'll continue to keep this updated. USDOT will continue to keep this updated as the more programs become available. Um, there's just a lot of information coming forward now after that bill's been passed. That's good. Okay. Any questions? Uh, then item 12 is upcoming events also. The 12th and it is conference season. I'm putting on group 10 slides. I put them on one. Next week is I saw of an inking. There is that hour and a half in the morning, specifically for local policymakers and elected officials um, to talk about some of the hierarchy and things. And then in the afternoon, it is a little bit more of a technical session. A lot of your engineers and things might find that useful. We do have APA Iowa coming up in October. Um, then Tumwa. We have the Iowa Water Conference in Dubuque uh, later this month, the 28th and 29th. And then Grow Sustainable Communities Conference. I put that up there because our ranking is going to be Park, John Thompson, and I will all be at that conference presenting on the successes of that. So, where is that? Sorry, that one is the 17th and 18th of October. It's a beautiful time to be in Dubuque. In Dubuque? Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, it's a great annual conference that the city of Dubuque puts on every year. So, quite local, um, but it's very much.
the national law. So, next slide. So, like I said, there are a lot of different grant programs that are coming out. We're trying to keep up on so getting all the webinar information out to you all. Um, this one came across our desk just before tech last week. So, we were talking about the greenhouse gas emission. Um, the carbon reduction program is having a couple of webinars through the FHWA um, over the next couple of weeks. There's two options, they are the same, um, but just giving two options for people. Um, note that it's in the Eastern. When I registered, I did not remember that part. Um, but if as you're thinking about this program, or if you're thinking about this program, do reach out and we can start handing you um, working through some of the greenhouse gas um, data that you might need to make that application. Next one. I think that's it for me on events. All right. Thank you, Bill. All right. Thanks. Uh, then item 13 would be for a vote on the uh, September policy committee agenda. This is police committee agenda. Move approval. <laughs> the policy <laughs> committee agenda. Please. Oh, should I go? Is there a second? Second. Second by county. Discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Any abstentions? All right. That carries. Uh, item 14 is other non action items. I know there are a couple. Allison, do you have one first? Or? Okay. All right. So the Iowa Highway uh, Research Board uh, is proposing a couple of changes to SUDOPS. And SUDOPS is the statewide urban design and specifications manual that a lot of our engineers and planners use um, you know, to design our roadways. So the proposed changes mostly fall under the realm of bike and pedestrian infrastructure to get that up to speed with a lot of complete street language. NACTO guidance and ASHTO guidance. And so um, we will include the links to these proposed changes in the meeting follow up. But the Bike Pen Roundtable is interested in taking these changes and offering a little more additional specifications for SUDOT to consider. Um, I will also be discussing these proposed changes at our upcoming MPO RPA quarterly meeting that the DOT puts on on September 21st. And then we'll compile all the feedback um, and get it to the SUDOC board before their October 19th meeting. And we'll also share it with the DOT's Bicycle and Pedestrian Advisory Committee, which meets the following day on October 20th. But we want you to be aware that there are changes coming. And it's not just for your, the reason why we're also talking about this for you is even if we're not the ones engineering our roads, this will have significant implications on project costs. One example I will give is they are now proposing for trail bridges to extend from a uh, 12 foot minimum bridge width to 14 feet minimum. That's a bit of a price increase. So it's something that we at least want to open up for discussion further with the SUDOC board before they go ahead and approve all these changes. So something to keep in mind. Thank you, Ashley. Thank you. Just two last things for me. Um, so we talked about the state of Iowa EV plan just last month, and I can obviously ask for technical participation segments of community members. Fellow survey to come up with some priorities, and we've been talking with the electrification coalition and our state city partners here in Iowa on how to start moving uh, the metro in this direction or start coming up with some priorities. Uh, so thanks to all the cities that have um, given information on that survey. Um, based on that, we were able to set a date of October 4th uh, with the Electrification Coalition here at the MPO um, for a workshop to start um, getting some of the basics down, one-on-ones with EV, some of the charging, um, some of the funding, and then we'll start developing what we want to do with the next steps. How many cities need to do a complete? Um, are there other organizations that need to come in? What are the final documents that we need to that we want to see come out of a process like this? So all this will kick off um, Tuesday, October fourth, here at one p.m. Um, and the registration link is on our website. And again, we'll go out in the follow-up minutes and um, also be provided to our tech members as well. So if you have any questions on this, if not, I can go to my last one. So as a mitigation grant season um, it is back again every fall. Um, it is open for the unified hazard mitigation assistance. Um, so this is more in that brick um, area. So building resilient infrastructure and communities program. Um, it was revamped a couple of years ago. Um, it used to really kind of hit on that top line, uh, but really now they're looking at disadvantaged communities, um, lifelines, nature-based solutions, climate resilient adaptation. And of course, bringing codes and things like that up to standards as well, so that that um, has impact on hazard mitigation and the mitigation of hazards. Um, so the state does want to 
see any of these applications before you send it on to FEMA. So the state deadline is December 27th um, of this year. Uh, if you have any questions and need a project that are significant enough to need a project that might not be in the hazard mitigation plan already, talk to myself or AJ Mom um, over at Polk County Emergency Management, and we will walk you through that process. It's very quite seamless uh, and not painful at all. So if you have any questions, I'd be happy to take them. All right. Um, anything other? Any other items anybody wants to bring up that we go to the to the order today? All right, if not, then uh, policy committee is next Thursday at four p.m. on uh, September fifteenth, and then the next meeting of the executive committee would be on October twelfth at eleven thirty. So, nothing further. We are adjourned. Thank you, everyone.